thank you. So it's lovely to meet you all. And uh, I thank the last speaker for the lovely introduction. Uh, my name is Lizzie Smith. I am a medical oncologist. Uh, I'm based in Cambridge in the UK. Uh, my focus is on GI tumours, but predominantly stomach cancer. Uh, so today I have the opportunity to talk about modern approaches to the treatment of advanced gastric cancer after second line. These are my disclosures. So what do we know about gastric cancer? Well, gastric cancer and esophageal cancer together make up the fourth most common cancer worldwide. This is a very aggressive disease. Uh, Two thirds of patients present with cancer that is not resectable and cannot have curative surgery uh, in Western countries. And because of this, in Europe, only 25% of patients are long-term survivors from stomach or esophageal cancer. And in fact, together, stomach and esophageal cancer are the second most common cause of cancer death worldwide. And until last year, there were no EMA approved options for third line treatment. So this will be the focus of the current presentation. To begin, what do we know about treatment in the first line? Well, these are the ESMO guidelines for advanced gastric cancer. We know that chemotherapy improves survival and quality of life for patients with advanced disease. Our usual standard of care is chemotherapy with a platinum and fluoropyrimidine doublet, or rarely three drugs, a triplet. We know that oxaliplatin is equivalent to cisplatin in effectiveness, but oxaliplatin is safer and probably better for older patients. We know that capecitabine is equivalent to infused 5-FU, but with more hand-foot syndrome. And unfortunately, we know that median overall survival for patients with advanced gastroesophageal cancer even in clinical trials, is less than one year. What do we do second line for our patients with advanced gastric cancer? Our standards of care for chemotherapy are either paclitaxel or irinotecan. These are based on a British trial, Cougar 2, or a Korean trial. We know that ramasurumab monotherapy has equal efficacy to chemotherapy in this setting. However, the best treatment, if ramosurumab is licensed, is paclitaxel and ramosurumab, which improves response rates and overall survival compared to ramosurumab alone. However, response rates or overall survival benefit from any treatment is modest. Overall survival is around six months for chemotherapy, maybe eight to nine months for combination of ramosurumab and paclitaxel. And this is where we were before third line therapies in the past few years. So this is the first question for the audience. The question is, what is your preferred treatment for third line gastric cancer? Is it no treatment? And I think this would have been a, a choice before because we did not have any level one evidence to support treatment. Would you prefer irinotecan or falfiri? Some of the uh, patients in the Asian Korean trial, the trial of Kang, had third line irinotecan, so this is the justification for this. Do you prefer trifluridine tipurosa? Or do you prefer immunotherapy with an anti PD1, which was nicely discussed in the last talk? Uh, the considerations would be nivolumab or pembrolizumab. Or Lastly, do you prefer to do something else that is not listed here? So I think that the, the moderators will, will tell me the answer to the audience score here. So, uh, do you have the answer? Would you prefer me to talk for a little bit longer? 
Нет, нет, мы, 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 уже, мы уже видим результаты на экране. Да, 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 появились ответы уже про голос. Да, everybody voted. You can see on the screen uh, their votes of our uh, viewers. Да. Мы вам Да, да, это верно. Большинство зрителей. You are right. Seventy-two percent of the decided immunotherapy. Interested to find out, and maybe your your last speaker, and you can tell me the answer. Is immunotherapy available for patients uh, with advanced gastric cancer in Russia? Да, на сегодняшний день иммунотерапия зарегистрирована. Yes, the immunotherapy is registered after two lines of treatment for patients with MSI. Because you know, we don't have the access to immunotherapy. <laughs> and also, I'd like to comment, one speaker commented that patients, they tolerate this immunotherapy quite well. It's uh, the comment of the last speaker. Could you could you repeat the question, Elizabeth, once again? Is the trifluoridine tebaracil uh, licensed? На сегодняшний день трифлюоридин тебаракил Российской Федерации пока для рака жира. Unfortunately, for the time being, these two medications they haven't been registered for the Russian Federation. В эфире у нас получается, что вы говорите вдвоем. And we don't see a lot of use of chemotherapy because maybe the registration is not done yet. So that's 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 good to know. Uh, so I think I can go on and speak about uh, the other uh, the other treatment. So I think it's important when we consider third line treatment for gastric cancer. How many patients will we treat? So these are data from uh, Italy and the US and uh, America showing how many patients in normal clinical practice can have second and third line treatment. And I think it's remarkable how consistent these data are. About 40% of patients have uh, second line treatment and about maybe less than 20% have third line treatment. So when we consider there are many gastric cancer patients, this is still a lot of patients, but also we should consider that perhaps now that we have more effective second line treatments, that the proportion of patients who have third line treatment will increase because we need to maintain fitness into the third line of treatment. So over the past number of years, uh, there have been four trials which have addressed treatment in chemorefractory gastric cancer. Uh, the first three here are immunotherapy trials. Attraction three, I think, was a, a two was discussed by your previous uh, uh, speaker very nicely. And so it was a randomized trial of nivolumab in Asian gastric cancer patients, positive for an OS benefit. Pembrolizumab was examined in uh, a phase two non-randomized trial primary endpoint O or or this was a, a global trial. We had a negative trial for immunotherapy in Javelin 300. 
uh, and fine when it was compared to chemotherapy. And finally, we have the TAGS trial, which is a phase three randomized trial comparing tri trifluoridine tibericil to placebo, an international trial, and it was positive for an OS benefit. So, in fact, TAGS is the only global phase three trial uh, to demonstrate a treatment effect, a treatment benefit for patients with gastric cancer. But I will discuss some of these in a little more detail now. So, the attraction 2 trial was the first trial which showed a benefit in uh, advanced gastric cancer for immunotherapy. This was a game changing trial. Uh, patients with chemo refractory gastric cancer were randomized to either nivolumab or placebo. The primary endpoint of the study was overall survival. Uh, and so this was an Asian gastric cancer trial, patients only from Japan, South Korea, Taiwan. And this was a very heavily pretreated population. You can see uh, most have three or four lines of prior treatment. And because it's an Asian study, uh, it was predominantly gastric cancer patients. So the, how effective uh, is nivolumab in chemorefractory gastric cancer? The, the response rate is modest. It's 12%. We see responses in PDL one positive and negative patients, but more patients benefit uh, than those who have a resist response. And this translated into an overall survival benefit of a 38% reduction in the risk of death. More importantly, the effect is at the tail of the curve. So an improvement in one year survival, doubling 12% to 27%, and also doubling of two year survival. So we see this long-term benefit in selected patients. So this was a practice changing trial uh, but we know that, you know, when we compare gastric cancer to the very immunogenic cancers like melanoma or lung cancer, that the survival benefit is somewhat less than we see for those cancers. Although this is a, a, a very important trial, the, the benefit is modest. Uh, but this is a very nice data that has emerged in the past year, the long-term follow-up from attraction to and what this demonstrates is that in patients who have a response to nivolumab, you can see that the two-year follow-up, the median overall survival is two years, and very few patients have progression. So this is fantastic for patients with advanced gastric cancer. Now, this is not so many patients who have the response, but still important and also, even patients who have stable disease have an improvement in uh, overall survival, a one-year uh, survival of 36%. So th there are clear benefits to this approach. And the question is often asked, uh, who benefits from immunotherapy? How should we treat? Should we choose immunotherapy or chemotherapy for these patients? And, you know, we don't know because there are no direct trials comparing nivolumab to other chemotherapies. There are some patients who may not benefit so much from immunotherapy. These, this emerges in large data sets from Asia where they use a lot of these drugs, a lot, a high burden of disease, many metastases, the presence of liver metastases and poor performance status. So these are, are, are clinical biomarkers predicting for perhaps a lack of benefit. Uh, and I will discuss uh, biomarkers, PDL one uh, in, in a few minutes. So the question is, does the data from attraction to apply to uh, non-Asian patients? And this has been one of the challenges in having uh, nivolumab licensed in uh, gastric cancer in Europe uh, because there is a feeling that perhaps the data is, doesn't support, uh, is not the same, the biology of the cancer is not the same in uh, Western patients. And so Keynote 059 was a study which was not randomized, uh, and so there is no control group, 
but it did look at immunotherapy in an uh, in, uh, international population. And what it was a large trial. Uh, the first cohort was 259 patients. And, you know, U.S. international patients, more junctional tumours as well as uh, gastric tumours. And so maybe not so heavily pretreated as, uh, as, as, as attraction to, but a very similar approach. And what we see is very, very similar results to attraction to the response rate, almost exactly the same. When we remove the patients who are MSI, we see a response rate of 9%. Uh, and what was interesting in a keynote 059, this may have been discussed by your last speaker, is that PDL1 status was, uh, was modestly predictive of outcome. So, in fact, in attraction to uh, PDL1 status, measured only on tumors, measured retrospectively, uh, was not predictive of overall survival. Uh, response is not available. Uh, in Keynote 059, so the approach is to measure PDL1 on immune as well as tumor cells called the combined proportion score, CPS. And so CPS of one is increased the proportion of patients who would respond. Uh, it's probably a better negative predictor than a positive predictor. Uh, but because of this finding, uh, pembrolizumab was licensed uh, based on response rate in the United States. And I'd be interested to hear in your discussion whether you prefer to use pembrolizumab or nivolumab. Uh, so uh, the question, and this is why I ask this question, uh, because we we can see that the uh, often the question is which is better, and for me there is no answer to that question because the response rates are equivalent uh, in in to, with, without biomarker selection. With biomarker selection, uh, the response rates are higher with pembrolizumab. But I think that you can see from these waterfall plots that it is really a class effect. And uh, I think that there is equivalence in terms of response rates. And it's, you know, it's, it's true that uh, immune checkpoint blockade is not the answer for all patients because we have uh, very uh, strong evidence that negative trials in certain populations Maintenance ipilimumab uh, was not successful compared to best supportive care after first-line therapy. And in fact, anti-CTLF were monotherapy. Response rates were only 4%. So we know we need combination. Uh, the first trial that compared chemotherapy with immunotherapy, which is, is, the, is the Javelin 300 trial, a velumab, a pdl one inhibitor, compared to chemotherapy, either irinotecan or paclitaxel, and no benefit in terms of overall survival for avalumab. Uh, and in fact, the progression-free survival favored the uh, chemotherapy arm, and response rates to PDL1 inhibition were quite low, uh, 4 7%, uh, and the same with chemotherapy. So I don't think that we can say that PDL1 inhibition is equivalent to PD1 in, in gastric cancer. So this, this was a negative trial. And even we know it, when we enrich for immune checkpoint in sensitivity uh, to immune checkpoint blockade with PDL1 in the second line setting, keynote 061, this was a negative trial. So you know the benefit is there, but the it is it is limited to selected patients. And the question is. How do we best select these patients for, for treatment? I revert to a summary of the data. If we compare the third line trials for nivolumab and pembrolizumab, response rates are equivalent, uh, about 12, 10 or 12 percent, and overall survival, median overall survival, is in the order of five or six months. Uh, and again, we look at the, the data in support of PDL1 uh, staining only for pembrolizumab, not needed for nivolumab. You can see that PDL1 uh, 
uh, positivity increases response rates by 15 percent. But you see there is no evidence of an effect on progression-free survival or overall survival. So this is not PDL1 staining with a CPS of 1 is not a particularly strong enrichment biomarker for efficacy from pembrolizumab. And the other biomarkers which are important, which I think uh, discussed with your last uh, speaker too, uh, again, these have not been assessed in chemorefractory gastric cancer, but I feel uh, that we should touch on them. I mean, MSI is very important to test for all gastric cancer patients, even at diagnosis, if they have operable cancer. Uh, and there is a clear benefit from immune checkpoint blockade in MSI cancers. We know this is few patients, 5% uh, in metastatic disease. But the response rates in Keynote 059 were 50, 60%. And we know that looking at this data from Keynote 061, a profound benefit compared to chemotherapy for pembrolizumab. So if we have an MSI high tumor, uh, they should be treated with immune checkpoint blockade. It, if it's available, it's better than chemotherapy. Uh, if we look at higher levels of PDL1 staining, this is a better predictor of outcome. I mean, uh, it, it, the, the response rates are significantly better in the second line and the first line trials. Uh, however, in the chemo refractory setting, we don't need uh, to say that patients are PDL1 uh, high expressors uh, because we can just use PDL1 CPS10. But to be honest, higher is, is better. Higher is always better. And other, uh, other, other biomarkers that have been examined uh, include uh, gene expression signatures, uh, and so the higher level of T cell uh, infiltration of the tumor is associated with a higher response. Uh, this is a research tool. This is not something uh, which is used in clinical practice. So uh, interesting, but this is not something we use in the clinic. And so uh, what is emerging as a good biomarker has not been examined in chemorefractory patients yet, is uh, tumor mutation burden. Uh, so we know that this is a good predictor of benefit, uh, but even in non-MSI high patients. So I think that they have now examined this in Keynote 061, which was the uh, second line trial, uh, a negative trial for pembrolizumab. If we look at tumor mutation burden uh, using two different methodologies, uh, the first is whole exome sequencing, a research tool, the second is the uh, Foundation 1 companion diagnostic. This is frequently used in clinical practice. And both methods find a proportion of patients, maybe 18% of patients, who have high tumor mutation burden. And when we look at immunotherapy for these patients, uh, we can see that it has high response rates, 30 40%, and a clear benefit uh, in subgroup analysis compared to uh, it compared to. Uh, chemotherapy. So this is one to watch. If you have data on your patient with TMB, I think that it's a it's a strong predictor of outcome for immune checkpoint blockade. And this might lead me to treat a patient with uh, immune checkpoint blockade rather than chemotherapy. And now I'm going to leave uh, immunotherapy behind and uh, focus on chemotherapy uh, for chemorefractory gastric cancer. And so uh, the, the trial which has driven a, a change in practice in this setting is the TAGS trial. Uh, this is the data from the TAGS trial here. Uh, it was a very large uh, global trial, so very important to note an international uh, recruitment. Patients were chemorefractory, at least two lines of prior treatment, and they were randomized to either uh, trifluridine to Viracil or to uh, placebo. And the primary endpoint of the trial was overall survival. And if we look at the patients who were enrolled in the TAGS trial there, as we might expect in many gastric cancer trials, they were mostly male. Uh, we see here that uh, recruitment in Japan was capped at 14%. So we know that these data are reliable for patients outside, uh, outside of, of, of Asia. 
I'm mostly gastric cancer patients, but one third junctional cancer patients. So um, what I see is is junctional cancers, but I, I I would imagine that perhaps in Russia, in, as we go east, we see more more gastric cancers. So uh, about half the patients had a prior gastrectomy, and they were heavily, you know, they had heavy disease burden. You can see that, you know, half of patients had uh, three or more disease sites. So these patients had a, had, a, had a lot of had a lot of cancer. Uh, and so this is the uh, take home message from the TAGS trial. Uh, primary endpoint was overall survival and there was an improvement in overall survival of 2.1 months for patients who were treated with uh, trifluoridine to Verisa, uh, a 31% reduction in the risk of death overall, and also an improvement in 12 month survival. So it, it, it increased from 13 to uh, 21%. So this was uh, level one evidence uh, for the first time for the benefit of chemotherapy in chemorefractory gastric cancer. And the progression-free survival, uh, the progression-free survival uh, is statistically significant. Uh, if we look at the median, it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's clinically uh, not, not so uh, impressive perhaps, but I think what's important here is the six-month PFS is improved uh, more than doubled from 6% to 15%. So th there are patients here who are not progressing, and uh, the median does not capture that. Uh, I think this is important for patient symptom control, and this is perhaps something that is where chemotherapy is a little stronger than immunotherapy. Uh, and this is, there have been many uh, detailed analysis performed on the TAGS trial, and this is looking at time to deterioration in performance status. So this is an important metric. How long can I keep my patient well for uh, doing what they want to do? And so there was a two month benefit in terms of, in, in terms of uh, deterioration to ECOG2 performance status. Uh, I think that for most uh, GI oncologists, uh, the toxicity of uh, trifluoridine to Bericel is well known. Uh, I also treat colorectal cancer in addition to gastric cancer. So I'm very familiar, as I'm sure many, uh, many, many of you are. If you're not familiar, this is a very well tolerated drug. It, it doesn't cause many side effects. So in fact, if you look at the toxicity of uh, the drug compared to placebo, they are almost equivalent. So most of these uh, side effects are due to the cancer. Uh, maybe a very slight increase in diarrhea, but the diarrhea is not severe. So I mean, so sometimes uh, I think uh, trifluoridine to beer cell, it causes some, I advise my patients, it causes some degree of upset stomach perhaps, but it's it, it doesn't have a lot of side effects. And this is really important for maintaining quality of life in the uh, in, in, in chemo refractory patients, in patients who have a, have a limited time, a limited prognosis. Uh, in terms of hematological toxicity, I think that we uh, we can see some neutropenia. Uh, neutropenia is, I mean, this is what we expect with cytotoxic chemotherapy. We're oncologists, and it's important to know for me, from uh, for the patient care perspective is that the patients do not have febrile neutropenia and they're not admitted to hospital with infections. So I want to keep my patients out of hospital when they have a limited prognosis. And so admissions to hospital with febrile neutropenia were very low. So I, I would say overall, this is quite a safe, uh, safe drug. So importantly, uh, the quality of life uh, was very important and measured here and presented by my colleague Maria uh, previously. So you can see that uh, the quality of life was not worse for patients who were treated with uh, chemotherapy with trifluoridine to Bericel. And in fact, there was no change in quality of life for patients who were treated uh, with drugs. So I think that's important. So uh, in terms of toxicity, and uh, the effect of a treatment on quality of life, it did not disimprove their quality of life. So this is good because we expect almost quality of life to decrease over time as the disease progresses, and this was not observed. So this is, this is good, good news for patients.
so in summary, uh, the quality of life was uh, preserved for all, uh, all, all patients. And importantly, on some metrics like time to deterioration of global health, uh, the chemotherapy was improved. And really importantly, so I think this is interesting, at the time of finishing treatment, so on progression, 74% of patients still had an ECOG of 0 or 1. So they could have a subsequent line of therapy if that was felt to be appropriate. And so the question is, is this suitable uh, treatment for all patients? And in fact, if we look, so are there prognostic factors or are there predictive factors? And so there are, if we look at the prognostic factors, how do we know patients who will have better survival? Well, we know that patients who have a good performance status, who are younger, who have less prior regimens, who have fewer metastatic sites, uh, HER2 positive, have better survival. And when we adjust the survival outcomes for these prognostic factors, there's a benefit for all patients. So including, I think it's important, including, you know, outside Asia, including, interestingly, important here, the junctional and gastric, both the same uh, and also a uh, number of prior regimens. This is uh, no prior taxane didn't seem to have a benefit. I, I, I can't understand this. This is a very small group of patients, and I think that the confidence intervals are wide. I think this is probably a chance occurrence. So we can say that the effect is beneficial uh, for all patients. And in fact, I, a very reasonable question that we ask is, some patients, they had a previous gastrectomy. Uh, this is an oral drug. Uh, is it effective in patients who have had, uh, who have had uh, an oral, uh, had their stomach removed? And so a very nice analysis here. It was presented by Dr. Ilson. Uh, you can see that patients who had a gastrectomy, uh, the benefit was, in, in fact, a little bit more uh, than in the trial as a whole. And so I think that this is not related to the stomach being removed, in fact, but is much more likely to be due to a lower birth weight. Sorry, of I'm sorry. But I'm essentially, sorry. Essentially, we do not have concerns about so, patients so, with a previous Near the end now, and this is supported by uh, uh, Dear Professor, unfortunately the time is very tight and we are lagging behind, sorry. Uh, uh, could we start voting? Could we start voting now? Because we are lagging behind the time and the time frame is very tight. Is it possible to start voting now? And then we can do the vote. So I think that we can say that until uh, recently, there were no evidence to support chemotherapy after uh, third line. This is a good global phase three trial with a positive treatment effect, and it's effective in all subgroups. So previously, our treatment paradigm was this, only to second line treatment, no evidence for third line treatment. And our updated guidelines from ESMO and NCCN recommend both immunotherapy and trifluridine tuberosal for patients with advanced gastric cancer, uh, if approved in that jurisdiction. So I think that was a very nice uh, opportunity to speak to you. And the question is, what is your preferred uh, treatment for third line gastric cancer after this? So should it be no treatment? Should it be irinotecan based on our previous uh, discussions uh, about chemo refractory trials? Should it be trifluridine tuberosal? Should it be uh, immunotherapy with anti-PD-1 or should it be something else? So I'll be very happy if the moderators can, uh, can tell me the answers once the voting is done. So I think we just need to wait for a, a few minutes for the voting to be done. I'm very interested to see uh, what the treatment, if, if anything changed. But it may not change because maybe some of the treatments are not available. So uh, in, in the UK, for example, we don't have access to immunotherapy, as I mentioned. 
except for MSI high patients. So I do hope that we can uh, have a, a new approach to, to EMA, but we uh, also the chemotherapy with trichloride inhibitors so is a very good evidence-based option. So uh, I am very interested to see the results of the voting. Uh, dear Professor, dear Elizabeth, we will comment the results that we received. For the third option, trifluoridine tipiracil, 25%, because unfortunately in the Russian Federation this medication is not registered, preference is given to the combination immunotherapy. But since trifluoridine and uh, they have the brilliant evidence-based base, our oncologist will be given a good option to treat patients with the metastatic gastric cancer. 20% for trifluoridine and tipiracil. Yes, I think that's, that's really fantastic. You know, we're all trying our best to help our gastric cancer patients. And uh, no matter what option we choose, you know, I think that we have an evidence base for everything. And increasing the number of treatments that patients can have is always good. So uh, I think that having more options is, is, is the best. I'm very glad that I could do some uh, discussions today around uh, the effectiveness both of immunotherapy and chemotherapy. Uh, and I think that we use our, our clinical judgment and also the availability uh, to try and help patients. Любовь Юрьевна, подведите тогда. Uh, Lubov, could you summarize uh, the presentation of the professor? Dear colleagues, I'd like to point out uh, that Lanserf uh, medication uh, uh, should be given in case of colorectal cancer, but we have the experience uh, uh, to use uh, this medication within the clinical trial in case of CRC. Uh, it's well tolerated, and uh, we received a very good clinical results in patients suffering from CIC. And I think this uh, medication uh, will work well in patients suffering from gastric cancer. It's not just a fluorine containing medication. It's a combination of uh, two drugs. And I think it's our future. Thank you, dear professor. It's uh, your uh, opinion is very important to Russian oncologists. So we we have follow up your uh, developments and achievements, and we are very thankful that you have found the time for Russian oncologists. We continue our work.